Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing really well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And here we are at part two of our story tonight, where Weston has taken a walk on the beach very, very early in the morning and he's encountered a Bigfoot and the Bigfoot's pointed out to a bundle on the beach and what is that bundle? We're about to find out. So let's continue with part two of our story but before we do don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up and let's get started with our story. Weston suddenly realised that this was some kind of mannequin like the ones you see in women's boutiques on display. What on earth was it doing here, washed up on the beach like this? All of a sudden, the pale, waxy mannequin flinched under Weston's gentle prodding, and he almost jumped out of his skin with a start. This thing was alive! It was a young lady. In a trice, Weston was leaning over the woman and feeling for a pouse. It was so faint, but she was only just alive. Trout was beginning to lick the woman's face like a flavourful popsicle. Trout, get back here, said Weston. Get back here, come on, boy. Leave her alone, good dog. Can you hear me? He asked the young lady. Can you hear me? The woman's face was covered in sea sand. Her eyes were shut. But a faint, muted mumble came from the back of her throat, as if she was struggling to say something. Weston wonders what the hell she's doing on the beach like this. He rummages around in the pocket of his khaki shorts, which are surprisingly deep which is why he likes to wear them. He finds his wallet, his penknife, and then the cold metal of his cell phone. He pulls it out of his pocket, relieved to see it has a good signal. Sorry about my dog, he says to the woman. He's harmless. Trout, get back here, boy. Stop licking the lady. Don't you worry, dear. I'm calling 911. Help will be here shortly, I can promise you of that. It was only a month ago when Weston had called the very same emergency number for his wife, and now he was doing it again with trembling fingers. 911? What's your emergency? Yes, hello. It's a young woman here. She's washed up on the beach. Yes, she's alive, but only just. Her pulse is faint, but she did try to speak to me. Yes, I will stay with her. The name is Weston Taylor. I'm with a large black dog called Trout on the beach. See you shortly. Isla's account. The dark, paralyzing, cold, unfriendly water, devoid of even a trickle of light, plunges me deeper and deeper into its murky, tenebrific depths, swallowing me whole, as if I'm caught up in a titanic-sized gullet of a whale from which there seems no escape. I'm dropping down so fast, as if there are cement blocks attached to both of my feet, dragging me deeper and deeper into the water. I'm like a miniature human-sized version of the legendary Titanic, slipping to the depths of the ocean. I cannot let the water take me down, so I fight as hard as I possibly can, with every last bit of strength that is left in my body. I have become like a punctured balloon, fast running out of gas and fading quickly. I kick and flail as hard as I possibly can, like a seal reaching for a pocket of air in the ice in order to take that desperate gasp of air again. I splash furiously. The bubbles and the sounds of popping air are so prominent to me. I manage to rise up to the surface for a brief moment, gasping and spluttering as I take a deep breath. I panel the waters frantically with my arms and legs, desperately trying to keep my head above water with doggy paddle-like movements. I'm swallowing lots of salt water. I sigh with momentary relief as I see the inky sky stretched out above my head and the pretty trickles of waning moonlight casting soft prisms of light over the surface of the water. It is incredibly cold. So, so cold. It's freezing and the cold is stinging my body, as if I've been pierced by hundreds of blue-bottle jellyfish. It's excruciatingly painful. My body stiffens and becomes numb, as if all the heat has left my body, and the last ashes of warmth within me 
are finally beginning to fade away. I can feel that I'm dying, but I need to kick as much as I possibly can to energize those fading embers inside me, to keep the fire inside me burning so I can try to keep warm. But I'm fighting a losing, joyless battle that has extinguished the candle wick of my hope. Even the clothes I'm wearing are turning against me as the weight of the material is dragging me underneath the waves. I keep talking to myself, encouraging myself, but it's so useless. I have to give up. I have to surrender to the waves. I don't have much choice, and I'm so cold. But another voice steps over the threshold of my thoughts. It's a strange, commanding male voice. I've never heard the voice before. It's persuading me not to give up. I'm sure the voice is lying to me. It has to be. How can I possibly win a battle like this against these furious waves? How did I even end up in the water like this? The icy blackness of the cruel, unforgiving water executes its grave judgment on all who brazenly venture out into the deep like this, who foolishly challenge to take her on. The water swaddles me on every side, with merciless frosty hands. My skin is blue from the cold. I cannot feel my body any more. I'm so cold. So, so cold. I've never felt cold like this before. It rattles my bones to the core, expunging them of all their warmth. Death seems like a beautiful choice for me now, than continuing to fight this losing battle of which there are only losses in this fruitless endeavour, and no winners. The power of the formidable ocean has taken many a sorry soul down to its treacherous watery grave. Why should it be any different for me? What makes me so special that I can be saved? How many ships have been lost out at sea over the years, and the bodies of those on board have not overcome the treacherous waters of the deep? especially in unforgiving icy conditions like this, where the ocean is so treacherously cold. Why should I fare any better? Obstensively in warmer waters, you might have a fighting chance of survival. But out here, the cold is an adverse enemy that can take you out furiously fast. I cry out to God, although I've never been religious. But when death, draws ever closer and closer. You'll turn to anything to help you, anything that might hear your cries. I can feel death's dark claws digging into me. I begin to ponder if there just might be a God who could potentially save me, help me. But if there is, why would he bother with me? For a moment, it seems like a good idea to just give up and surrender to my watery fate. But the words that come out of my mouth are contradictory to that. They're not that eager to give up. It seems that there is still some fight left in me. I cry out, help, help, please help me, in a tiny, small voice. Then like a swift, magical answer to prayer, something profound happens, but I can't explain. I'm not even sure what it is, but it's big, it's mighty, with forceful arms that jerk me forward. I feel as if I'm being thrown onto a warm carpeted floor and being propelled steadily through the water by something with a powerful motor, but oddly it gives off no mechanical discharge. I'm breathing above the water, being cradled securely into place by a very furry safety belt that pins me to a soft wet carpet of robust flooring. What is happening to me? I must be on the floor of a motorboat of some kind, with a silent engine that is plunging through the waves with powerful forceful thrusts that rocket through the water, leaving me in no doubt that this boat has a formidable, very sturdy engine, for it moves swiftly, efficiently and gracefully through the water with ease. The boat I'm on seems to be breathing, moving beneath me. And as far as I know, boats don't breathe like this. It's a strange, rather idiosyncratic experience for me that makes no sense at all. Finally, the boat rises out of the water like a man. 
I find myself being lowered very gently and carefully to the ground. Where am I? I wonder. I'm no longer covered by water. What a relief! I struggle to open the slits of my eyes that are crusted over with sea salt, so heavy from exhaustion and fatigue. All I want to do is to fall fast asleep. I'm fighting the tiredness as if that is now my enemy. I feel exhausted like a tank of petrol that has run dry, so I can't move a muscle any more, even if I want to. But I'm shivering with the cold as my wet clothes cling to me unapologetically, keeping my core temperature at a dangerous level that could easily invite hypothermia to steal my life from me. I try to make sense of what I'm seeing. What is that, I wonder, as I try to open my eyes? I know people hallucinate when they're suffering from hypothermia. Is that what I'm doing? Is that what's happening to me? I can't be sure. I observe a huge towering blob of black. It's covered in wet hair, standing before me with seemingly worried yellow eyes. I notice a furrow developing between his brows, as if he's perplexed. What is this creature? What is he? I can't make sense of him, but the yellow eyes are incredibly distinctive. But at the same time, he's benevolent and very, very kind. His eyes are not to be feared. They are warm like two light bulbs giving off a pleasing heat. But I have to be hallucinating. Surely this thing I am seeing cannot be real. The next thing I know is that this huge creature is cradling me to his chest. And the delicious warmth of his body filters right through my icy clothes, thawing me from the inside out. It's such a good feeling, such a relief. I feel warmth swaddling me. He smells of sea salt and seaweed. I can feel my body thawing, the iciness leaving my body. I drift in and out of consciousness, feeling the blissful waves of warmth lovingly enfold me. It appears to be sucking away the wet of my clothes, like one of those hand dryers you get in a communal public bathroom. A voice drifts into my head. I sent help on the wings of the gal, and in the siren of their screams. Someone is coming for you. They will be here very soon. Help will not be denied you. It is not your time. Your end will never be in the water. The warmth that enveloped me finally leaves me, and the arms that cradled me have gone. I have no idea where the thing that cradled me so lovingly has gone to. I wanted to please come back, but I have no sense of it any more. But I'm not as cold as I once was, which is a huge relief. But I'm not out of the woods yet. I know death is still a possibility for me. I feel her dark, hungry shadow hovering over me like a vulture, looking for an opportune moment to seize me. But her time has not come yet. But she waits in hopeful expectation, as if my death is a given. I can feel my willpower to keep fighting is beginning to flail. I don't care any more. I really don't. But that annoying, resolute voice keeps returning to my head, telling me it's not your time. I'm trying to argue with the voice, but I'm so tired of fighting. Even arguing is too much like hard work. I just want to give up. I want to let go. I want to float up into the clouds to be one with all that is. My throat is dry, my lips parched, my head aching. But my clothes are miraculously dry around my body. They still cling to me. I cannot think clearly or even coherently, even though I try desperately to gather my thoughts like a child's glass marbles. But when I try to gather them together, they just roll away from my grasp and scatter. I hear the squawk of seagulls above my head, soaring in the skies. They are normally annoyingly obtrusive, but today they're oddly reassuring, even comforting. When I do manage to half open the slits of my eyes, 
All I see is a fuzzy glaze of a yellowing sky spilling over the water and the golden disk of a rising sun, which suggests the morning has just been birthed. If only the sun would come out now. I urgently need her warmth all over my body. It would be so greatly appreciated, gladly receive. I'm so tired, so tired. I could sleep for an eternity and it wouldn't be enough. I cough and splutter. My throat burns. It's as scratchy as sandpaper. My body is now throbbing and everything aches. And everything is so stiff. I feel so close, yet so far away. All of a sudden I hear the rush of fast-moving feet. Something warm is snuffling all over me, licking my face with a warm, wet tongue. A dog begins to bark. I hear a man's voice. Trout, come back. Don't do that. Get back, boy. I sense a form hovering over me. I know I'm being studied as a face looms into my field of vision. I notice a nose, a mouth, concerned-looking blue eyes, framed by a pair of lightweight spectacles, and silvery hair that fringes a thin face. Someone is leaning over me, feeling my pulse. Are you all right? Can you hear me? says a male voice. I try to respond, but I cannot. I'm opening and closing my mouth. All I taste is salt and bitter bile. My mouth is encrusted with beach sand, like chicken nuggets coated in bread crumbs. Nothing comes out of my mouth. Instead, it's just a strange, raspy gurgle. <laughs> what is happening to me? I feel as if I'm trapped in my head, unable to look outside of myself, like an ungainly lump of jelly washed upon the beach that children kick with their flip-flops. The stranger pats me gently on the shoulders. His muted voice breaks through my panic. I try to latch on to his words like a lifeline of hope. But the coming words slip and slide away. A flow of sound that I cannot fully or entirely comprehend or even decipher. I'm calling for help. Don't you worry, my love. Everything's going to be fine, says a warm voice, taking my cold hand in his warm one. Don't you worry. I've called the ambulance. They'll be here in a minute. I sigh with relief, knowing that help is at long last on its way. After a while, I hear the sound of muted voices rolling in and out of my consciousness, like the background noise of a radio. A wash of sound that tries to break through to me, but I can't make out the words. She's over here, says a man's voice. She's not looking good, I'm afraid. I can barely feel her pulse. I think she's been in that icy water, although oddly enough, her tangle of clothes appears to be dry. But I think she's fading fast. He lowers his voice. I'm not sure she's going to make it. Her skin is blue from the cold. Don't worry, sir. We'll do our best to help her, says a female voice. Your name is... My name is Weston Taylor, and this is my dog Trout. You found her like this on the beach, sir? Yes, I did. She was pale and waxy. At first I thought she was a mannequin. Thanks for calling us, sir, says the voice. You may well have saved her life. I feel a warm blanket being thrown over my body. Someone is leaning over me. Can you hear me? comes a woman's firm voice. Her breath is warm on my face. I can smell traces of coffee on her breath. Hello, comes the voice. Can you try and open your eyes for me? Can you look at me? Can you see my finger? What hand am I holding up? Left or right hand? Which finger? I struggle to open my eyes. But I think I manage to because the woman keeps saying, Well done. That's good. Can you tell me your name? I find myself staring blankly into kind, chocolate-coloured eyes. Can you tell me your name? The voice repeats. I try to answer her question, but once again my doggedly unfaithful voice refuses to oblige the earnest requests from the woman. My mind has gone completely blank. It even hurts to think. 
I don't know what my name is. I couldn't give her a name even if I wanted to. Instead, I gurgle as salty water mixed with spittle trickles down my mouth. Can you hear me? asks the woman again. I manage a nod. Good girl, she says, patting me gently on the shoulder. Do you know where you are? I manage to say the word beach. Beach. That's right, you're on a beach. Can you tell me how you feel physically? Are you hurting anywhere? Uh, I'm tired. Tired. Have you been in the water? Yeah, yes. Good girl. Good girl, you're doing incredibly well. I'm proud of you. Are you hurt at all? My head. My, my throat is sore. I'm cold, I croak. We're getting you help. You'll be out of here in a stretcher any second, she tells me. I now feel afraid, because I feel like a broken doll, and I'm not sure that being moved is actually a good idea for me. What if it really hurts when they lift my body? Everything passes in a dreamy, hazy, ambiguous blur. I'm lifted onto a stretcher, and thankfully, despite an aching body and a throbbing head, a scratching throat... I don't experience any sharp pain. That's got to be a good sign, surely. The man, calling himself Weston with his dog Trout, hovers over me for a moment. I hope you get better soon, young lady. The hospitals are very good. They'll sort you out. I hear his dog barking, as if echoing his sentiments. I would smile if it didn't hurt so very much. I can feel myself being ferried away on the stretcher across the beach, and a couple of early morning beachgoers are garrulously enjoying a good gossip at my expense. What happened here? I hear a woman's voice. You don't think she's going to die, do you? Why was she on the beach? Do you think she was actually in the water? Do you see how blue her face is? Do you know how cold that water is? If you're in it long enough, it'll kill you. Well, I'm sure she couldn't have been in the water, surely. I mean, she was on the beach, but I mean, it doesn't look like her clothes are wet. I'm now in the ambulance. People are attending to me. Voices are assuring me, drifting in and out of my consciousness like passing ships in the night. But I keep floating in and out of my blurry state. But I pick up snippets of conversation along the way. I'd like to know what she was doing on the beach. Her clothes look like they're wet, but she appears to be dry. It's very odd, isn't it? Why was she tangled up in seaweed? That's what I want to know. I spoke to the man who found her on the beach. He thought she was a mannequin. You don't think someone attacked her, do you? There's a large contusion on her head, as if she succumbed to a big whack. Poor thing. Do you think she's going to be all right? I've seen a lot worse than this. And they pulled through, came a male voice. As long as we keep up her core body temperature, she'll be fine. The voices continue to sway in and out of my consciousness, merging with the crunch of footsteps and the shuffle of people moving things around, in the ambulance, fiddling with various devices. The walls are pale yellow in colour, and it smells strongly of disinfectant, which is markedly pronounced. I'm sitting propped up in a hospital bed in the accident and emergency department. I'm waiting for a doctor to see me. My clothing is removed. I'm wearing a hospital gown. I'm dry and warm. I've already been seen by a nurse who's taken my blood pressure. The curtain has been drawn around the bed. The bottom area is wide open. I see a teenager boy with a plastered leg lying supported above him in some kind of a harness. He looks up at me through dark, curious eyes. I meet his eyes, but he flushes with embarrassment and hurriedly looks away. I try to make sense of my surroundings. I know I'm in hospital, and I know I was found on a beach by a man called Weston with his dog Trout. I remember being in the water. I remember drowning. I remember being dragged out of the water, but everything else is ambiguously foggy, like when you look through a steamed-up mirror in your bathroom and you can see not a thing. 
even if you wipe the steam away, because it reappears again and makes everything foggy. I hear nurses efficiently striding past, calling out instructions to other healthcare workers. It would seem I'm not the pivotal point of their focus or concern, which is a great relief. I sense that the danger I was in must have at least passed. Perhaps I'm going to be all right after all, even though my head is throbbing violently, almost as if someone has hit me in the back of the head with an ice pick. I can hear the clutter of medical equipment and trolleys being wheeled across the floor backwards and forwards. I hear a male voice getting ever closer. He stops to talk to a nurse. The one from the beach, I hear him say. I then see the doctor venturing into my line of sight. He's a man in his fifties or sixties. He's wearing a white coat with a stethoscope draped casually around his neck like a woman's scarf. He has dark hair that does not hint of even a trespassing grey hair. But his crepey skin and the lions around his eyes, a soft feathering of sorts, with sagging jowls, give his age away. He studies me for a brief moment through his earnest eyes. He gives me a warm, friendly smile. Hello there. I'm Dr. Nate Valensky. He picks up his clipboard at the end of the bed and moves towards me. So how are you feeling, young lady? He asks me. I felt better, I say, attempting to be humorous. I just feel a bit odd. My head, it, it, it's throbbing violently. And I feel dizzy, disorientated, very tired. Can you tell me your name? Asks the doctor. I open my mouth to answer. But like on the beach, nothing comes out of my mouth, even as I try to speak. I suddenly feel dreadfully self-conscious. I'm sorry, doctor, I say, emitting an embarrassed laugh that sounds more like a cat's tormented yell. I, I can't remember. I can't remember. That's all right, said the doctor. Can you tell me where you live? Where do I live? I say out loud. I, I'm trying to think. It, it, it's, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. It'll be with me in a second. I shrug my shoulders. Sorry. I can't remember, I say apologetically, but I'm sure it'll come back to me in any minute. I then look up at Dr. Valensky in alarm. Why can't I remember, I ask. Is there something wrong with me? Tears spill down my cheeks, which I shamefully brush away. The doctor looks at me through sympathetic eyes. You've had a shock, young lady, but you're in a very good place now. You're in good hands with us. We'll take great care of you. I think you're suffering from a bout of retrograde amnesia. But with any luck, your memory will soon return. I will be running a few tests on you. I can feel my eyes longing to close. I want the doctor to leave me now, so I can surrender to sleep. But the doctor is speaking to me again. I need you to sit up. I want to listen to your heart and lungs, if I may. Of course, I say, obliging the doctor's request with a measure of reluctant unwillingness. I just want to go back to sleep. Dr. Valinsky removes the stethoscope from around his neck, placing it on my back and on my chest. Can you remember swimming in the sea? He asks me. You were in the water, were you not? I remember, yes. I, I was in the water. But I don't know why I was actually there. I, I remember the water. It was so cold. The bubbles... I remember drowning. I remember being pulled out of the water, lying on the beach. The doctor frowns and says, But you don't know how you got into the water. You have a nasty contusion on your head that suggests that someone might have hit you very hard. I'm going to do some CT scans on your head to look at your brain. Do you think someone was trying to harm you or possibly attempting to drown you? Can you remember? Maybe they thought the cold water would ultimately kill you. In truth, if I am being frank with you, it's amazing that you're not suffering from hypothermia. That water is a killer. You couldn't have been in it for very long, even if it might have felt like an eternity. My eyes flood with tears when the doctor suggests someone might have wanted to harm me. The trouble is I can't remember anything. I know not if I have any friends or foes. Because I can't remember anything or anyone 
or even why I was in that water. Can you tell me what you do remember? Well, I was numb. The water was dragging me under. There were bubbles, popping sands. I thought I was dying at one point. It was so cold. But something big and black with bright yellow eyes saved me. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. At first I thought it was some strange motorboat, because it carried me on its back. I'm not sure what it was, but it had a human face, and it was nine foot tall, with powerful arms. It warmed me to its chest, cradling me in its arms like a baby, and then it just went away. And that's when a man called Weston Taylor and his dog Trout appeared on the beach. That's all I remember. The doctor is giving me funny looks, as if he thinks I'm slightly delusional, dreaming up fictitious creatures like this with yellow eyes, rescuing me from icy cold frigid waters. But I know, I know it was no dream. The doctor gingerly maintains a polite expression on his face, and if he's shocked by my strange revelations, he hides it well. Well, it's a good job this western fellow found you on the beach and called the ambulance as quickly as he did. Because we were able to get your core temperature up. The water in these parts is icy cold and can kill you if you're not careful. So if you have been seeing creatures with yellow eyes, it's not surprising. One of the side effects of getting very cold is hallucinations. I'm concerned about a possible lung infection here. So we'll have to keep you in for a few days at the very least. I think we need to keep an eye on you, and I'm a little concerned about that contusion you sustained on your head. Is it serious? I asked. And my condition, I mean, Doctor. No, it's just a precautionary measure on my part. Keeping you here at the hospital is what we will call precautionary. But if my instincts serve me well, you're going to do just fine. You've just had a nasty shock. Being thrust into icy cold water can shock the entire system physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. We'll put you on an IV drip, as you are very dehydrated from swallowing all that salt water. You need lots of fluid. I shudder as I unwillingly digest the uncomfortable weight of what Dr. Volinsky is saying. I'm going to spend a few days here being monitored by the doctors, but I don't know who I am, where I'm from and why I ended up on the beach in the first place, or drowning in the ocean, more to the point. Worse still, Dr. Volinsky has hinted at the possibility of foul play as the reason why I was in the water in the first place. And supposing he's right. Supposing someone was trying to harm me or even kill me. I don't remember anything at all, beyond my dreadful struggle in the water. Why can't I remember what happened? I may not know who I am, but I'm not stupid, nor am I foolish enough to take a swim in such disturbingly chilly water just for the fun of it. So how did I come to be in that water in the first place? My account of my bizarre rescue has surely affirmed to Dr. Volinsky that I'm suffering from delusions, or that I'm lightly as mad as a March Hare. If I didn't get into that water on my own accord, someone put me there. Someone intent on harming me. But why? Yet despite the kaleidoscope of my tangled and shattered thoughts, the one thing I know with certainty is that I was rescued by a big black hairy thing with yellow eyes and a human face. I knew he cared about me. And it was when he cradled me to keep me warm in his overlong arms and rocked me like a baby and commiserated with my plight and told me in my head that everything was going to be all right. I know I wasn't imagining things. He was huge, I was tiny in his grasp, swaddled by a great big body that gave off such an incredible amount of heat. This thing, whatever it was, had fortuitously arrived on the scene after I cried out to God. I'd never believed in God. Maybe he was an angelic being of some kind. Who says angels have to have the stereotype halos and large white wings? It was true when that great big man like hairy giant held me in his arms. I felt as if I was being enveloped in the loving arms of God. I remember the icy coldness leaving my body straight away, becoming so warm again, 
Not even the blanket that they put on me when I was in the ambulance was as warm as this thing was. But I dare not repeat any of this to Dr. Volinsky because he'll think that I require a brain transplant, if there is even such a thing. I know he's worried about my retrograde amnesia and the blow I seem to have taken on the head. Let's just say it probably accelerates his concern, especially if I continue talking about a fetitious dark creature with yellow eyes. I've been moved to a different ward. I'm so lucky that my bed is near the window and overlooks a courtyard with pretty flower beds strewn with colourful spring flowers, manicured grass and an arched pergola draped in the whispers of purple wisteria and a glorious tangle of climbing red roses. There are park benches painted in purple scattered liberally across the yard and patients wearing pyjamas with their visitors sitting on the benches or on wheelchairs and talking. I like to watch the comings and goings of people. It relieves my boredom. My brain is beginning to feel clearer and sharper, but I still cannot remember who I am, where I live, where I'm from, what I even do for a living, if indeed I do work. I cannot figure how old I actually am. I have a sense that I could be in my late teens or early twenties. I might still be at school or in college as a student. I know not the answers to these enigmatic, rather curious questions. So if somebody was wishing to harm me, and had potentially tried to drown me, how could I possibly recognise who they are? How can I see them as a threat, as I don't even remember anything? Imagine if they come after me again, whoever they are. The thought leaves me filled with panic, that brings on shivers, even when I'm not cold. I've been placed on a drip, so that's why I guess I'm feeling a lot sharper in my head. But why is my estranged memory so aloof, so insouciant, so disconnected to me? It might be a help to actually know who I am, but the more I fight my ambiguous, uncooperative, foggy, fragmented blur inside me, the more it seems to mischievously float away from me, as if I'm chasing after a very naughty dog in the doggy park that refuses to be tethered to my lead. Dr. Volinsky has told me to relax, to keep calm, and then in time my recollection should come marching back, like a gallant army of warriors that fills in all the blanks for me. This disabling amnesia is so not funny. I do not even recognise my own face that stares back at me in the mirror. Believe me, it's the weirdest feeling in the world, not even to know what you look like. I could see that I might have some Italian ancestry in me, but that's only a wide guess. It's the dark hair and the dark eyes that has led me to this outrageous conclusion, although I'm lightly horribly wrong. It's certainly not set in stone that because I look this way that I do actually have Italian ancestry. It's the not knowing who I am that is freaking me the hell out. Dr. Valensky keeps assuring me that my memory might have been hijacked by all the trauma I experienced. He did check my reflexes and balance and did tests on me to check my thinking, judgment and memory. And the only thing that appears to be an issue is my long-term memory. The doctor's going to give me an MRI scan to shed some light on my condition. But I'm struggling to keep my panic under control. And not knowing who I am, my age, my history, is eating away at me like a worm and an apple. The doctor has warned me that I would be visited by two detectives who had various questions for me. So I would be expecting them any time soon. It was a man and a woman wearing plain clothes, but I knew at once they were detectives. They introduced themselves to me, and the woman stared at me through her dark eyes and said, I understand from Dr. Valinsky that you can't remember anything. Is that true? So there we are. That is the end of part two. Isn't it getting very exciting? I look forward to you joining me tomorrow night. Hopefully we're going to find out who this mysterious woman is. Until next time, goodbye and good night.